lead us in a study of the next, actually for the next uh, two or three weeks, to uh, continue on in Matthew there. I'll be doing Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, we won't get too far into it today. There's some things I want to talk about as kind of an introduction to the study, but we'll get into the study a little bit today. So over the next few weeks in chapters 24 and 25, we're going to be dealing with a lot of end times teaching, the end of the age. Almost all, almost all end times teaching is controversial. Even in that community of believers who are really solid when it comes to the deity of Christ, the inerrancy of scripture, uh, salvation by grace through faith alone, even amongst people that hold all that, there's quite a diversity of thought on all the details of uh, end times teaching. So, there's going to be a lot of disagreement about the particulars in the events that we're going to be, uh, in the timing of the events and in the events themselves that we're about to study about. So, we're going to look at these issues with 1 Timothy 1, 5 in mind. And uh, I'll just read 1 Timothy 1, 5 to you. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Faith, For some men, strained from these things, have turned aside to fruitless discussions. We don't want fruitless discussions. This is the word of God. We're going to teach it. But uh, the goal of this instruction is love from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. Accordingly, I'm going to read view um, briefly, I hope, for all our sakes, uh, my last message on how to handle doctrinal disagreements in the body of Christ. How do we handle disagreements when we're both looking at the same scriptures, we're both uh, seeing things maybe just a little bit differently. Now, for, for essential doctrines, there's no room at all no room at all for disagreement. How many ways are there to, to God? One. The Bible says it in the plainest language possible. There's no, there's no room for disagreement. Um, the deity of Christ, there's no room for disagreement. Uh, the inerrancy of Scripture, the Scripture is our guide to faith. There's no room for disagreement. If we take the book away, we take away everything we know about God. There's no room for disagreement. Salvation by grace through faith alone. We can't bend on that one. In fact, in the first chapter of uh, Galatians, Paul and remember the Galatian Christians were having teachers coming to the church. They had accepted Jesus by grace through faith. And teachers were coming into that church saying, well, that's good, but that's not all of it. You need to uh, accept all of the Jewish, uh, uh, all of the Old Testament teachings that were for the Jews and basically become cultural Jews. Uh, Paul said at that time, if any man comes bringing a gospel different than I gave you, let him be accursed. There are important things in Scripture that we cannot bend on without just tearing the fabric. We can't bend on it. For essential teachings, for a few essential teachings, there is no uh, bending or compromise. But there are other issues where we are to accept someone who has differing views from ours, and we're not to accept him, to uh, look down on him, or to uh, think he's uh, 
not very smart. We're not to uh, accepting to uh, condemn what he teaches. Uh, we're going to read in that context. We're going to read a little bit out of Romans 14. We're still in our introduction here. Romans 14. Romans 14 starts out in verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Uh, here's an interesting thing about uh, those who are weak in faith and those who are strong in faith. We all think we're the strong in faith, and the other guy is the weak in faith. That's the way it goes. That's people. However, Many of the issues, well, all the issues we're going to talk about, they do have a right answer. And I think I'm going to give you that answer today. But you know what? There's guys out there that teach differently, and they think that they have the right answer. They think that I'm the weaker brother. I think they're the weaker brother in this, in this instance only. Uh, Going on there in, in uh, Romans 14, he says in verse 10, and we still remember the talk is we're still the context is disagreements that we have within the body of Christ over matters that are not essential. We're not talking about deity of Christ. We're not taking, talking about any of these other uh, real essential issues. But he says in verse 10, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. If I have a disagreement with you, I am not to think, well, this person is, can't be a Christian. They don't agree with me. Or I'm not to look at you with contempt or pity or whatever. Uh, because you have a different opinion than mine. 1 Corinthians, 13th chapter, second verse tells us, uh, if, I have, if I know all mysteries, if I have all knowledge and don't have love, I'm nothing. So as we're looking at these uh, uh, passages, and discussing end times in these next uh, couple of chapters that we're going to be dealing with, uh, it's far more important to love one another than it is to get exactly right. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us there in, in uh, Corinthians 13 chapter, that if we can, we can have it right. Maybe I'm right on everything. But if I look down on people that don't agree with me, if, if I think they're maybe not too smart, or if I think they're maybe they're not believers at all because they are, they're not accepting um, uh, a literal translation where I feel it should be accepted. If I'm doing that, I'm nothing according to these scriptures. You've all heard me quote Justin Martyr. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. Uh, in the context of this, is uh, Justin Martyr believed that uh, at the end times, after Christ came, returns to earth, he's going to set up a kingdom. It's going to last for a thousand years. It says that, literally, in the book of Revelation. But uh, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of good people, who believe that it's uh, not to be taken literally. Well, Justin Martyr, he didn't say, well, you guys... You're all going to hell because you don't believe the plain word of Scripture. And he doesn't say, well, yeah, maybe you're going to heaven, but you're pretty stupid. He doesn't have that opinion about them. Listen to what he says. This is what I believe. And then he tells what he believes about the kingdom. He says, but there are many good and godly men who don't agree with me. 
And that's the spirit that, I'm, that I want us to go into these studies with. I believe, I truly believe what I'm going to teach you today is truth. I'm going to teach you scriptures as I see them. That does not mean that when I get to heaven, God is going to pat me on the back for being 100% right. As a matter of fact, one of my heroes on this earth is Pat Sokol. And he says, I'll be pleased if I'm right 60% of the time. <laughs> Did he say 30? I thought he said 60. Well, this is a great man of God. And uh, we just have to understand that our minds aren't all we think they are. Uh, but we do the best with what God gives us. If the devil can get me to think evil of a brother because of his views on uh, some peripheral doctrines relating to the end time, he succeeded in destroying unity. And if our unity is destroyed, our real mission, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, our real mission will suffer if we're not respecting one another, loving one another in a spirit of unity. So, <clears throat> but as a pastor, I need to teach scriptures as I understand them. And if you find yourself disagreeing with me on any particular point, realize I don't think less of you. I don't think less of your walk with Christ because of these disagreements. And, and I hope that's reciprocal. Quoting John Hopler, another one of uh, the guys that I really appreciate in this world today, we must honor one another as believers in Christ. And... We must be honest with what we believe scriptures are teaching. It's my job to preach the whole counsel of Christ. It's not my job to teach only those things that are absolutely crystal clear, the essential doctrines. It's my job to emphasize those, to teach those. But my job is to teach the whole counsel of God. And when I'm doing that, Sometimes we're going to be talking about things that are just not nailed down in the body of Christ. There are, going to, there are disagreements. I want to tell you why I think that uh, how I, I really think I'm worth listening to on this subject, believe it or not. <laughs> I, as a young man, as a child, I don't know how old I was. I might have been eight years old. might have been ten. A man came to our church, an uh, evangelist for the denomination that we were with, and he spread a big chart across the front of the church, and he taught that um, we're living in the ch church age, that the end of the church age, Christ would come and take his people to be with him in heaven that that would institute a seven-year period of tribulation. And at the end of that period, Christ would return. And at the end of that, there would be a thousand-year kingdom. And at the end of that, there would be eternity. Well, he said it. I believed it. Then I went to college. And I was a theologue at Marion College, which means I was in the ministerial uh, study. And uh, the first book I read on the end time subject was a book by uh, George Ladd. It's called Blessed Hope. And that book taught that Christ, uh, he wouldn't come from the church for the church before the tribulation, but he would come for the church after the tribulation. And that kind of pounded bumps on my head. I, I read the book. I read it hard. I followed up all his scriptures, and, and guess what? I thought, this guy has it. I was wrong. The next book I read on the subject was by a man, a good man, called Merrill Tenney. I believe it was called Revelation. 
And in it, he taught that what I had heard as a child. And I followed his scriptures, and I, boy, oh boy, I didn't see where, I couldn't see where he could be wrong. So I, at, I did something that uh, I'm pleased that I did it. What I did was I got a notebook out, and I put two headings on it. And one heading was pre-trib rapture, and the other heading was post-trib rapture. Christ will come before the tribulation. Christ will come after the tribulation. And then I uh, read the Bible from cover to cover. And any verses that I thought would support pre-trib rapture, I put on this page. And any that I thought would support a post-trib rapture, I would put on this page. I was surprised to see that there were, I had a number of scriptures on both sides. So, uh, but where I came out, because I thought there were far more and far more powerful verses, I came out as pre-trib rapture. Now, is that true because I spent thousands of hours, because I've done this over the years uh, two times fully, Plus, I've also got my books out and gone through all the, the prophets several times and making these same kinds of lists. So I have thousands of hours invested in this, and I have a lot of prayer invested in this. Does that mean I'm right? You know what? There's guys teaching the opposite of what I teach that have thousands of hours invested, that have prayer invested. I love those guys. I think they probably love me, if they've ever, which they haven't heard of me, but if they had, they would. <clears throat> now, here's where I'm going. If I heard that any one of you had spent thousands of hours researching a particular doctrine, because I respect you, because I love you as brother, sister even if I don't agree with your conclusions I think I would hope I would make a very great effort to see your point of view to understand uh, why you believe the things that you believe why you believe the scripture is saying these things I may not be convinced by what you tell me and I may ask you some questions. Have you considered this verse? Have you considered what is your teaching on this as we study through these issues? So I don't expect you because I have literally spent thousands of hours researching this. I don't expect you to believe it. I expect you to listen. And I expect you to, uh, uh, because it, it, it isn't in the scripture if it's not worth talking about. Controversial issues are worth talking about if they're in this book. This is God's word. We're, we're not going to set something aside because it's controversial. Okay. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Well, actually, we're going to start in... Uh, I want to read a little bit at the end of, the, of Matthew 23. Matthew 23, I'm going to start with verse 37. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you shall not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, we've just, in the previous chapters, uh, if you've been, had the privilege to hear Dan teaching, uh, we've been talking about uh, the way that the uh, uh, 
religion had evolved the Jewish religion had evolved and it did not it wasn't at all about a relationship with God it was about a relationship with rules 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 upon rules and they weren't in and they'd gotten to the point where they'd taken the original set of rules and added hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules to them so that the uh, the religion became a an exercise in in um, strength of our will to obey all these hundreds and thousands of rules and it had lost the essential quality of relationship with God so uh, We'll start with 24 now. Oh, by the way, the nation is about to be destroyed. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.